Good morning, and welcome to the Wednesday morning class coming to you from Heartlight Spiritual Center. And for you that are out of state and out of city here in Charlotte, North Carolina, we welcome you this morning. You that are joining us live on, on streaming or Facebook and to you that are here. So we just finished our Tai Chi chair exercise and uh, we're raring to go. We've got circulation, we've got energy moving, and we're ready to come together for this hour of a hope, enlightenment, and uh, expansion of consciousness. And also I'm going to add in correction of old misperceptions that we've picked up along the way on our path. Sometimes we reach out and we take this from society, culture, some religion, or somewhere, a, a tribe of people or a family, and we pick up things that, don't, that does not resonate with our innate intelligence. And for those things, sometimes we get challenged with information from a different point of view. And that's, that's spiritual. I want you to know that. So don't resist anything. Contemplate all knowledge and information that is offered to you in this class. And judge it not right or wrong, good or bad, but hold it in the neutral space of your heart until it resonates your own innate intelligence center. At that point, you qualify it as a belief because you know it's true. You don't start from belief. You start from knowing to believing. Most religion is about believe and then know it later in heaven. <clears throat> no. We want to know it here and now, and we want to then qualify it as a belief system in our etheric blueprint, and that will help to drive our cellular development from a different frequency or vibration that eventually could ascend our bodies above illness, sickness, disease, and who knows, at some point, death itself. The Bible says the last enemy death shall be put under our feet. And feet means understanding. <clears throat> so let's begin this morning with... Uh, Daily Word, and what I feel I've been directed to is, I am supported as I move forward with determination. Determination. Reaching for my dreams encourages me to grow as I set new goals, learn new skills, and stretch myself in pursuit of new experiences. Through it all, I use my determination to keep me on track as I pursue my goals especially during those times when I might feel frustrated, discouraged, or uninspired. My spiritual practices help me and keep me focused and determined. In prayer, I touch the stillness and strength of God that lives within me. I affirm I am strong, focused, and determined. Everybody say that with me. I am strong focused, and determined. I give thanks for everything and everyone helping me to achieve my goals and realize my dreams. Today, today, I am secure in the awareness of my determination, which helps me to stay the course no matter what life brings my way. The scripture is Psalms 138 and 8. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me or we would say, in me, through me, and as me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Forever. Let's all take a deep breath, and let us be present. Being here is one thing, but being present is another thing. Where your body is doesn't mean the consciousness is always present where your body is. You can, your consciousness can go off in the past, and go off into the future, it can go off anywhere. But bring your consciousness and align it with your body, with your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and feel that alignment <clears throat> to receive. So we're continuing on with the body-mind uh, workshop idea. And again, I want to say to you that I do believe that, as everything else, we're in a tremendous shift in every system that we've known. <clears throat> and it's not that these systems in any way are always what we would perceive as bad or not good, but meaningful on our journey to grow 
to find new opportunities to expand our possibilities and our attentions. This is very important that we understand that this is a time in which we are preparing ourselves, preparing ourselves to be open light beings, to receive all this wonderful new information that I believe is trying to break in to human consciousness. And it's been standing at the door knocking. And every time I say that, I remember my grandma's picture of Jesus at the door knocking. Every, every grandma probably had that in their house at some point. But it's a famous Christian uh, portrait of Jesus standing at the door knocking. The thing that's interesting about that picture, just to show you how different I was and how I saw things differently, I noticed <clears throat> that there was no opening to the door on the outside. The person on the inside had to open the door. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I mean, how would you notice that at eight, nine years old? But I did. And I said, where's the doorknob? There's not, no way Jesus can open the door. The door has to be opened for the presence to enter in. So I invite you through your willingness to open the door of your mind, the door of your consciousness to receive what spirit has to say to us. So in this shift that we're in, one of the systems that has served us so well for decades has been the body-mind, uh, the body-mind-spirit paradigm. It's a wonderful teaching tool. It still remains a great teaching tool as long as we're still in the overlap of third dimensional language. But as the language is trying to adjust itself and tune itself to understand a fifth dimensional language, which is not a language that we use, that we've downloaded in our brain. Like here in America, most of us probably present are speaking English although we have people now that speak Spanish and we have all kinds of people that has come into America with all kinds of different languages. But, and even though I have found so much in the last 40, 50 years of studying and taking back English words into Greek or Hebrew, and then when I learned about Aramaic, the language that maybe Jesus would have used, a third dimensional language, I realized that all of those languages, even though they in themselves have a different frequency, to help us to understand more deeply that they're all terrestrial planetary languages. Well, spirit speaks spirit. It doesn't speak earth, it speaks spirit. And we have to learn the language of spirit. And we might, the only way that I could explain, maybe give you an example of that would be through telepathy. That knowing, and every one of you has experienced this. You've walked into a situation, met a person, and you just had a knowing, but no words for it. Hmm? You ever had that? I, 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 and this is why I think that I notice a lot in the English language how people fill that moment in with, you know, you know. I hear speakers do that all the time, and I thought if you take all the you knows out, you wouldn't have much to say. You know, you know what I mean. Hey, man, you know. No, I don't. But we'll say, yes, we do, because we don't act like we're, you know, not smart. So we'll say, uh, uh, yes, I do. And most of the time you really want to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so we fill in those moments rather than understanding them as an opportunity to go to still point for a new language to come in. A new language of knowingness, a language of remembering, a language that is not a language that we put into syllables and vowels and consonants and all those things, but a language that is trying to emerge into us that is going to really direct us into the next uh, step of our bioconscious evolution in itself. So what I'm saying to you that uh, that was a good tool, but it still has a overlap of religious terminology to it. You've got to watch these words like even God or spirit. These are very religious terms. And you have to realize that there is a language within the language in itself, and it's the language that I'm talking about <clears throat> uh, for you, is that moment of knowing something, but maybe you don't have the words for it. And every one of you, if you really take stock for a mo moment, have experienced those times. So finally, when I came into this idea that is brought in by Max Planck, uh, Einstein, all of the fathers of, uh, of what we call quantum uh, physics, 
who tells us that everything is energy, I got it. I got it. That even though we're taking the one thing that is one, the energy of consciousness, and then we put it into categories that make us understand uh, three-dimensionally. So I get a body, I get a mind, I get a spirit. But those are still three things of the same thing that has become different forms. And like the ego system, it always separates everything from the body, the mind, and the spirit. But when you realize that all of that reduces down to the same thing, and that is everything is energy. <clears throat> so when I came into that, it kind of shifted me a little more out of the body, mind, spirit into the idea of energy. Everything is energy. And, and how could I mention this and not mention the, the, the ice, water, and the steam? That's a good one. That's just the best one that anybody could understand. Uh, and understand that those are all the same thing at different temperatures. So I won't go into all that because you've heard me talk about that a lot. But the fact of lowering the temperature of steam uh, makes it become a more dense substance of itself, which is water. And then when you freeze it, it becomes uh, three-dimensional ice. So that's the body, mind, spirit. But they're all made of the same thing in that six-sided hexagonal water molecules. The same thing. So this is what we're heading for, but we're going to continue in this overlap to use these terms, body, mind, spirit, to get us to where we need to be. Just don't think the body, mind, spirit teaching is the goal. It is the means to a different goal. So <clears throat> what I want to begin to talk about today is something that is fascinating me for a long time that I think is a missing piece in the healing arts, and that is that we tend to start our life at birth. I personally question that. I know that we, uh, and I plan to talk to uh, the expert that we know here at Heartlight, and that would, uh, uh, that would be uh, Susan, uh, who is the astrologer. But I wonder why we don't uh, understand what sign that we are at conception rather than birth. I feel like there's something important there of uh, the time that we were conceived. So we, we kind of do away with this whole journey from conception to birth. We kind of edit it out. We start everything at birth when we become a body. And uh, I don't personally see it that way, and I'll do my best to share that with you. But uh, a statement was I read it a lot of years ago, and it just uh, was so real to me. And it was a, a statement by the Catholic Church that said, give me your children up to six years old, and we have them for life. And I never forgot that. What do they know? What do they know that roots their doctrine into a person that even though when they know they've outgrown it or they need to leave, they don't? They stay in it because it is the deepest root of their assumptions of what reality was while they were being formed. So they understood this. They, they understood something, and they used it for their own benefit. So, as you know, I love taking things away from the way religion has used things to bring it back to spirit and bring it back to a different intention and a different direction. So I do not think it starts at birth. I think the moment that we uh, uh, are conceived and the egg and the, uh, the sperm uh, becomes the, the, the ovum, uh, that something shows up, and I'll get, get to that. I think there is a reason for gestation, why there is pregnancy from all the way from seven to 10 months. I was a 10-month baby. I think Tim said he was seven months. So anywhere in between, you'll find yourself. Nine months is kind of the, the one that we accept as the average, but that's not always the case. Uh, there's different times in which that happens. Why does that happen? For what it's worth, I think it happens because it takes that long for the soul spirit that is incarnating to adjust itself to the body that it's going to inhabit in a lifetime. 
And if you stop and think, what is your vibration without a body? What was your vibration before you ever incarnated in that in-between lifetime stage? It'd be a much higher vibration than the body that you have right now. Because this is ice. Everybody got it? This is ice. And, and, the, and, and most religion believes in the fall of mankind, right? The fall. But what they don't understand, it was a fall in temperature. It was a fall in frequency in which the density was became trapped. So really your body is trapped energy, just like ice is trapped water molecules. And that's what form is. Form is trapped energy at such a dense level that it shows up with a shape and a form. So when you are that without the body stage, the afterlife of the body, that's what afterlife is, the afterlife of the body, then you are in a much higher frequency than the body you're going to inhabit. So that means there has to be a process of how that you are going to change your vibration before you fully inhabit the body. Now, I had an experience. This is one of those major experiences in my life. I've talked to you a little bit about it, but it was when I was trying to find out why I had this innate anger in me. Now, what I mean innate anger was not an anger that I got once I got here. I'm not angry because of the way my parents did me, angry because of this or that. It was something I brought with me into this body. It was, it was entwined in the fabric of my physiology. It wasn't emotion. It wasn't a feeling. It wasn't a past memory. It was just something that was a part of me. And it took me a few decades, actually, of working through this. And uh, it was back in the mid-80s that I discovered such things as uh, past life regression. And I thought maybe I need to do that. So I went to some of the best people because I was traveling around the country and had access uh, in these retreats to very uh, uh, famous people who did this kind of thing. And I found all of that to be very interesting. Uh, but it didn't give me the answer that I wanted. Little did I know that my answer was not in a past life, but it was in, 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 in an in-between life. And I began to experience that. Now, this is, this is really bizarre because where I had the experience was the first time I spoke at Unity of Charlotte. And this goes back so far, some of you may remember uh, uh, Bonnie May, but that's when they were on Sharon View. In a little building on Sharon View, many, many years ago. That's where my first time that I spoke there. And I was nervous because I had not spoken in a, a unity or a non, new thought church, and I was really trying to be impressive, and I had it all figured out what I was going to do, and this, that, and another uh, in the workshop afterwards. And as you know, spirit took over, and I didn't go the way at all that I prepared my brain to go, and spirit took over. And I started talking and at the same time, now this is so important what I'm saying to you because this is the first time that I understood dimensions existing at the same time. That dimensions weren't over here, one, two, three, but they're one, two, three, four, if we would number them. And I begin to experience being able to talk and let spirit use me in the workshop. And at the same time, I begin to have a review going on on another dimension. And I want to share that with you today because I feel to do it. I never talk about this unless I'm directed to do it. And in this, I guess, inner vision, I don't know what you call it, I saw myself before I incarnated in this physical life called David. And it's hard to talk about this because it was so transcendent of any language or any third dimensional uh, symbolism. But I just remember me standing there and I was very... Uh, Young, everybody that I've seen that's not in the physical body looks about 30 years old or so. If you've ever seen anybody that's gone to the other side, you're going to see them about that age. About the age that it said Jesus went out at 33. Isn't that interesting? He was a young man when he had the resurrection and left this physical third dimensional world. And it seems like that's kind of a set age area in which 
Uh, 33 is such a powerful number. So anyway, I looked about like that at that time. And I was well into my late 40s when this happened. But I looked younger. I looked healthier. I looked less dense and physical. But it was me. It's me. And uh, I was standing there in front of this table. And there was three entities. And they were conversing with me without language as I knew it. It was totally through telepathy. We just had this inner language going on with each other. And I realized that what was happening in the first part of this was kind of a life review of my past experiences. And this is why I'm such a believer in reincarnation. I don't back down on reincarnation at all because I didn't learn through knowledge. I learned it through an experience. And I can't be moved at experience. You can say what you want. You can try to uh, debate me. You can intellectualize it, whatever you want. But you're not going to budge me on experience. So I knew what was happening. And they were reviewing all of this. Then they said to me in an interesting way that this is my last lifetime in this third dimension. And... Uh, I'll try to condense this as I can, and because all this was more of a knowing than a language I'm giving you, but I'm, I'm communicating. And <clears throat> they said to me, because the earth is a free will planet, that's why souls will come here. Souls will take handicapped bodies. Souls will do anything to get into the earth because you can use free will to grow faster here than almost any dimension, planet, or anywhere else that you can be. And this is why I remember somebody in a book calling Earth is the hottest piece of real estate in the universe. <laughs> and I, I never forgot that. I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, and they were saying to me, because it's free will and because there was an order of beings incarnated in the Earth that have finished all their third dimensional incarnations, that collectively we have not reached the level to contain and stabilize the new norm that was coming in. Do you think I understood that language at that time? Absolutely not. It had to be a deep knowing in me. So let me say that to you again, because that's, that's, that's a, a mind bender a little bit. Wrap your mind around it. So they said to me, Earth is a free will planet. <clears throat> and I could go into why that is, but maybe another time. And they said to me, because there is an order. Now, what we call that order, the Bible calls it a Melchizedek order. But you know what we call it? Light workers. They are the light workers, the first fruits of the harvest. Hmm. The Bible talks about the first fruits of the harvest. And that's really what the church is supposed to be. The church was supposed to be the gathering of those souls who have finished all their incarnations in third dimension coming together to be trained to heal the planet. And so they said to me that because of free will, that those who have attained this last time have not in consciousness uh, entered the level to stabilize a new norm that was coming in. And they said because of that, that they were looking for those to volunteer. And that's the thing that fascinated me about this whole experience, is I didn't feel anything over me. I didn't feel some God over me. I didn't feel anything making me do anything. I didn't feel anything had predestined me. I, I was totally everything that I had seen outside of myself, I was. Does that make sense to you? I was the God I had worshipped out there. I was the Christ that I had given my life to. I became all of those things. But I didn't know that. I didn't quite understand that. So they said to me, and they did this calculation, and they said, now here's what I was angry about that showed up is in here. Let me go on. So they said to me, for me, to attain where I've not attained through free will of lifetimes, I had to choose to live four lifetimes in this one. Now, everybody has a different number. This is mine. But here's what I was, excuse me, pissed off about. 
and I really was, I found out that I had been very angry at this God that religion had told me about who called me and chosen me to start preaching as a teenager. I was angry that I could not have any sense of a normal third dimensional adult childhood adult experience. Now I know you, 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 you have to understand that this was not easy to stop school, which I was very good in, and stop uh, and leave my parents who was good to me and I wanted to graduate, and I wanted to go to the prom, and I wanted to do all the passage rites that a human being goes through as much as anybody to be pulled up out of life and start preaching and ministering. I'll never forget the night that I, I left on a train. Oh, so much I could say to you here. But I mean, the first time I left, because I had this job playing the organ in Wilmington, Delaware, that some preacher had got me, and my folks couldn't do anything with me. They didn't touch me. They didn't touch that part of my life because we had a contract with each other, agreement. That's why I chose my mother and my father. They knew at some level that there was a part of my spirituality that did not come from them, but through them. And that part that came through them, they never touched and I know their hearts had to be broken. I was the only child, close, parents, everything. But I got on this train, took off at 17 years old. Now, I'm just trying to give you some kind of picture of what, how difficult, looking back, that this all had to be for all of us. It was not an easy time. And it didn't work out, by the way. I wasn't the right one for the job. And ended up some minister in Philadelphia picking me up and put me in a Y, and I ended up as the almost the janitor of their their revival center theater in Germantown in Pennsylvania, you know, and scared to come out of my room at the Y because of all the characters that were there and living on bananas and fig newtons, and I hate fig newtons to this day. <laughs> but anyway. I felt that was the anger that I came in with, of being and believing I was a victim of God, of God, that I had no choice, that God made that choice for me whether I wanted it or not. And so anyway, what I'm trying to get to is I was able to go through my entire conception to birth experience and I won't go into the details of it but what was interesting about it is how that I would come into the body that was being formed for as long as I could but the frequency would not hold me and I would leave and come back and come back and come back and I'd stay longer and I'd stay longer and finally on the by uh, the uh, 20th week, there's what's called a quickening. And that's when you begin to merge between your soul spirit with a, your physical body. But it still takes all those months to happen before you inhabit the body at birth. At birth. So I kind of have my own personal understanding of abortion and all that, you know, that's personal stuff you got to work out for yourself. But I kind of understand both sides of that issue. And I'm a little both sides on that. I'm not for abortion by any means, but I certainly, at the same time, and for women making that decision, uh, I just think the answer to it is always the raising of consciousness. If people were more consciousness about bringing souls in here instead of just, just having sexual intercourse to bring a soul in is because we're an unconscious people. We've lost the rhythm. Animals have better rhythm than we do. I mean, they go into heat for a certain time and they reproduce. Not us. You know, we've learned the pleasure center of the whole thing and we want to repeat and we get addicted and all that kind of thing and we bring in souls that aren't ready. Why am I getting into this today? 
souls that are not ready. When you see a troubled child, a troubled baby, and uh, look into its eyes, most likely that soul was pulled out at the time it was not ready to be incarnated. I'm sorry, these things don't always happen later after they get here. They come in that way. And I've also looked into a baby's eyes and saw this angelic, uh, this, this gleam in the eye, and you know that's a spirit that is right on target to incarnate. And then you're going to find someone that's going to be a contributor to society. It's going to grow and mature and all of that. So I guess I believe in the rhythm system. <laughs> <laughs> that I think people should be more conscious and take responsibility. You know, even in the Bible it says that, and people think every baby that's born, God brought it in. That's not true. The Bible says that God said to, uh, to those in the garden, said, go and multiply. I'm not going to multiply you. I've given you the ability. You must take the responsibility of multiplying yourself and passing yourself down through your genealogy. I know that's touchy. It's truth, I believe. So anyway, it took me 10 months to finally merge with this physical body. And when I did, the best way I can picture it would be like going through the, the portal, you know, going through the portal. When you, when you start that experience of feeling the labor and the pain of the mother, you're born in the pain of the mother. And when you go into that channel to come forth into birth, it's quite an interesting experience. So because the, they said to me, we're looking for enough people, what we'd call a critical mass of people, to choose to live out whatever lifetimes would bring them to the level of consciousness, I, I did that contract. I did that contract. Nobody forced me and made me to sign, so to speak, that contract. I did it. I said, yes, I will go. I will do it. But when I started the birth into the actual inhabiting of the physical body, I became frustrated and anger like, what did I do? And I was a hard birth. That's why my folks never had another child after me. My mother said, never again. <laughs> and I was over 10 pounds. Yeah, yeah, it was a tough birth. Uh, I didn't come in easily. I didn't come in easily at all. I didn't want to. So uh, anyway, this whole experience I'm telling you was my healing. The minute that I remembered I did the contract and I said yes, I had nobody to, to in any way blame, not even God. And I realized if I'm not the victim, then I'm the empowerment of my life. And I choose this day. And that, that particular, it doesn't mean I don't, humanly get angry or whatever emotions that we have. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this innate thing left me and I was free from it because the truth about my journey from conception to birth was where the answer was. It wasn't because I remember at that time I was doing that everybody was um, Oprah had, I can't think of his name, the famous guy where everybody was doing the child healing thing. I can't think of his name. Who? Yeah, Bradshaw, absolutely. So I did all that and, you know, went back and wrote a letter to my young self and uh, I, I looked for the answer in my mother and my dad and nothing fit, nothing fit after I got here. I couldn't find an answer because the answer was that important part. And this is what's missing in the healing arts as far as I'm concerned is you can't start with a person the minute they've become inhabited in a body and believe they are the body. You've got to go back to where the story really begins of your incarnation and that is at conception. Now, since then, it is proved that when we're in the womb, the first thing uh, of the senses that is developed is the hearing. Also, the last thing at transition or death is hearing. That's why I've warned people. 
do be careful what you say with family members that are in comas and you think they can't hear you. Absolutely they hear you. Because hearing is the last thing to go. But inside you start hearing. So how do you hear as a fetus, as a, a body being formed? You hear through vibration. See, vibration doesn't know boundaries. It doesn't know when to stop uh, at a wall or here or there. So everything that is going on around you, the environment that is being made for you is being stored in to your biology that's being formed. It becomes the fabric of your body. So if you're blessed to have a lovely environment, lovely parents who loved each other, uh, a father that talked to you in the womb, now they read stories, now they play Mozart, They've learned to do all kinds of things while in the womb. But it's been slow coming and should have been happening a long time before that. But the ego mind is, if I don't see it, it doesn't exist. So it's just this fetus that doesn't know anything, nothing's going on. My responsibility starts at birth. No, it started at conception. At conception. And what I've learned in doing the energy work in some energetics is that a lot of people's trauma and why they're not getting healed of things in the body is because a lot of that is recorded in the connective tissue before birth called the fascia. The fascia is the connective energy network that knits you together as an energetic being. So I have learned that tuning forks uh, and I'm talking about the tuning forks that have weights that you feel the vibration is one of the most subtle ways of moving trauma out of fascia and bringing it up into the consciousness so that we can get rid of it and change it. So that's just a little, a little plug for some energetics and tuning forks. <sighs> Why am I doing this today? I, 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 I don't know, but this is the day. This is the day. So that's my experience. <laughs> What an experience it is, and it has served me well. So let's begin. <laughs> All of that was to set the stage. We're going to start with the prenatal pattern, decoding the language. This pattern traces the development of consciousness that takes place during the gestation period, from preconception to birth, and how its development is reflected in the body. The prenatal pattern that has been most extensively understood is in the work of what's called metamorphosis, which recognizes not only that the time period is accessible through various parts of the body, but that we can instigate deep change by working with these specific areas. We already know that the moment of conception sets uh, of conception sets in matter all the genetic inheritance that are going to form us. So we understand that the moment of conception, your hair color, your eye colors, all of that is, is set at the time that that was uh, really what happens. We call it sperm and egg, but actually it's two sets of information. Hmm? 23 chromosomes of information enters into 23 chromosomes of information of the mother and the father. You are their word made flesh. Are you with me? You are their word made flesh. That's your genetic DNA story is you are the result of two bits of information coming together as an interface. So, uh, these genes are like the building blocks of our being, the blueprint that formed at conception built those bricks throughout the gestation period. We can honestly say that genes make up the whole of us physically. The genes create that is a unique us. And this is why the ego loves the body without the identity of spirit becoming the body. Please get that. Even a new thought we're a little 
short of the glory because we believe the spirit is in the body. But we don't understand the spirit has become the body. And as long as you believe that, you're imprisoning your spirit into your human experience until your body becomes the prison of your spirit. Now let me give you a scripture on that. Before Jesus left and they ascended, he said he stopped by and preached to the spirits in prison. Isn't that a great scripture? How can you all not love the Bible when you really see it out of religion? It's so powerful. He stopped over at our spirit and said, hold on, there is a generation that will come that will free you out of the prison of humanity, of the human experience. Mm. That's a whole message, isn't it? In itself. The prenatal pattern is based on the presumption that at the moment of conception, now get this, there is an energy present apart from the sperm and the ova. Woo, something's showing up now. That which is going to become the true me, incarnate, showed up at the moment conception took place between my parents. And it showed up to remain a part of the process of how gestation was going to merge my vibration with my body vibration so I could be born. And that's called a fullness of time. Now you mothers here, I mean, that to me that's got the, the amazing moment is that moment that it all begins. And you really never know. You don't know what day, what moment that that birth experience is going to happen. It could be different times of the day. It could be before your due date, after your due date, whatever. It, it's, it's almost mystical. And that's called a fullness of time. That means that the merge has happened between the soul and the body, and they're ready to merge. And that's what birth is, the merging of the inner, the outer, the soul, and the body. There are many names and variety of spiritual thoughts surrounding this, all tending to imply that the new being first uh, emerges totally in the abstract as consciousness without form. It is then attracted toward the physical plane and is further attracted to two particular people within the physical plane, being to be, in, uh, to be in, uh, where we enter into matter. The gestation process, all the individual potentials and characteristics of that being are built in and established within. Now listen, everything that occurs during gestation period and beyond is therefore a part of that which we attracted to us at conception. The person you end up marrying, the person that you end up being with the people along your way that you're intimate with. You know, again, just like bringing souls in, if we'd have been more conscious people, we'd be more conscious who we was intimate with. And I'm going to tell you why. Because when you have sexual relationships with another person to the point of the frequency of what we call a climax, the souls intermingle with each other. And that's called sometimes a soul tie. So people, if you've ever had the experience or no experience of people that are in abusive marriages but can't get out. I've seen it. I had a cousin. I had a cousin that was in a horrible marriage. And uh, the, the man beat her up all the time. But they ended up having the greatest sex after it. And she knew, i got to get away, and I can't, because she had given her soul so much to him and was so tied to herself in him that she didn't know how to leave herself in the marriage and stayed in an abusive marriage that can end up horrible from murder to whatever else. Come on, I'm talking deep stuff here, but it's time to go deep. It's time to get to the, put the axe at the root of the tree of what and how are we going to change this pattern 
The people are changing their mind. They're having positive thoughts. They're having mental affirmations. They're doing all the right things mentally, but they're not changing the pattern. They're not changing the blueprint. And that's the work that's got to be done that I'm very passionate about, as you see. So at the moment of conception, there's an energy present, okay? A conception takes place, the being that, that we enter into shows up, we attract our parents, our genetic line. And a lot of people go, why would I do that? Especially if you're in a situation where a parent abused you or left you, the dad left you in many cases, it's always mostly the dad that leaves, but mothers leave too. And mothers don't always aren't best mothers. Hmm? But once you take the responsibility, you're not the victim, but you attracted to you what it is that was going to form your psyche. Why would you want to form your psyche in that way? Because then you can turn that pain of the psyche into the gold of compassion and understanding to minister to those people who's had that experience. All ministries should come from the experience, not from the knowledge of the Bible or the knowledge of theology. Or the, it's got to come through the experience. And I've told you, this whole, this whole building of a, of a community of beings together who are all sharing this same vibration of the last incarnation called the Ecclesia, or the church, started between Jesus and Peter. So I'll go through that again. And I'll keep going through it again until you really get it. So Jesus comes to Peter. Who's Peter? Faith. The power of faith. Comes to Peter and he says, Peter, who do they say I am out there? See, this is how religions started, different religions. Because you had a little group over here that said, oh, he's, he's Elijah come back. I like that. So I'll go join this uh, group, the first Elijah church. <laughs> No, I said, no, he's Jeremiah, come back. I know it's Jeremiah. So they started a little church over there called the J Jeremiah Church. And they kept going through all these different groups that were saying that Jesus was the incarnation of this and that one, which is another proof of reincarnation. Because Jesus didn't say, oh, that reincarnation stuff, get rid of that, it's of the devil. He didn't in any way. That's not what he was looking for. But Peter had the right answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He didn't say, Jesus, you're the Son of the living God. He said, to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son, the only begotten Son that we all are, is the Christ. Jesus was just the portal, the way for this truth to show up on the planet. He was a sixth ray of all the rays. If you know about the rays, he was a sixth ray being on the sixth ray. That's why six are so powerful. That's why they don't, they don't, they don't want you to be afraid of 666, for instance, or the fact that uh, when in some energetics, when Tesla said three, six, and nine, six carbons, uh, atom are made of six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons, 666, because it holds within it no longer empty space in the cell, but a teeming, subtle, electromagnetic field of possibilities of, of, of truth to bring us to awaken to our wholeness. Sorry, today I'm just not feeling like dancing around and wading around the pool. Let's launch out into the deep. <laughs> Let's launch out into the deep. Hmm? I want you to come with me as we do that. Everything that occurs during the gestation period and beyond is therefore a part of that which we attracted to ourselves at conception. What does that say? That means, one, you're not a victim. Secondly, everything you attracted was as a teacher to give you an opportunity to learn something 
to form your unique psyche or ministry, same thing, in the earth. What we call the soul purpose. And you know you're never going to find happiness, not happy, but happiness until you're aligned fully with all that you contracted and brought forth in the soul body connection at conception. You'll never be happy until you're aligned with it. Finding the most perfect person did not and will not make you totally happy. Having all the money and the fame and the whatever, having anything on the physical realm will never, never fulfill the yearning of your purpose that you contracted to live out in this earth. And we have lived in the ego's world of nothing but one distraction after another distraction. How much of our life has been distracted? This is the most time on history of mankind of distraction through his electronic devices. Let's put it out there. Everybody's distracted. From your nine, ten-year-old grandchildren to everybody that you see, everybody is distracted. What a great tool for ego to use to prove our separation. Listen, going and turning on your phone, and I'm not saying we're not going to do that. It's the world we live in. But we, all I'm saying is stay conscious of it. Don't let it put you totally back asleep again. Stay conscious with it. But here's the ego. See, the ego has no truth. It borrows truth. And the truth of going within was very important. Going within, going within. So the ego says, I'll come up with my own version of going within, and I'll have you go into the Internet. And the internet became the internet. The net that caught us. So now we go into our phone, we go into our Facebook, we go into this. Everybody's going in. But not here. They're going in. The electronic devices. And if you want something to feel fearful about, it's not a virus. But if you want to feel f about it, it's going to be AI. Uh, artificial intelligence that is slowly taking over what humans have done. If you want to be concerned about something, keep your eye on that one. People are marrying. Did you know that? They're having sexual relationships, falling in love with robots that are very human looking. Men are saying, I don't want to put it with some woman. Some woman says, I don't want to put it with some man. I'll just get me a robot. A robot has shown up at the, uh, at the UN. I think her name is Sophia or whatever her name is. Looked like a real woman. Sit before the UN. This is not what is meant by the new human. <laughs> when I talk about the new human, I'm not talking about a new robot that is able to fulfill what humanity has tried to fulfill in your life. Uh, speak, Lord, speak. <laughs> the growth of the fetus from a single cell is to fully form human beings in an extraordinary process. And this says of creation, but I'm going to change it. It's not creation, it's formation. Remember this. Of course, in Miracles teaches so well. Creator creates. Spirit creates. Ego forms what has been created into a miscreation. Hmm? Don't confuse form with creation. Form is another word for miscreating what's been created and forming it. Bible again, clues right in the very beginning of the first chapter of the book <clears throat> that tells you, and God breathed the breath of life. It said, first, God created man, mankind, in his likeness and image. Now listen to this. And created them, both male and female, and called their name Adam. No Eve, no Eve. Male and female were two polarities that had come together in perfect balance. But what, he, what was created was given lordship over the planet. 
So in the second chapter it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the life. Create, first chapter, form, second chapter. That's why the work is not with creation, it's with formation. And the only tool that will bring uh, formation up to the vibration of creation, oh, my time's getting, uh, a creation is going to be something called evolution. Now, I'm not speaking necessarily of Darwinism. That's kind of been misproved. Even Darwin understood. He didn't think that would last at all. I heard Greg Braden, who showed up. I know, I'm, I'm closing up here. Uh, uh, Greg Braden, you know Greg Braden, was speaking somewhere, and the granddaughter of Darwin showed up at his meeting and thanked him because he was saying that we as humans today are not the result of Darwinism evolution, but of something that intervened and changed 200,000 years ago that brought forth a fasted, rapid growth in the human being that was outside of the evolution, but it was the evolution of consciousness. Oh, let me say this to you. Up until, up until that time, evolution was a slow process until it evolved us to consciousness. It's called the breakdown of the bicameral mind. It literally, and the minute consciousness showed up in evolution, consciousness started driving evolution, not evolution driving to consciousness, which is a slow process. And all of a sudden you could consciously make decisions and collapse time and collapse years and collapse ages. You could start growing fast, 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 fast. as you wanted to. So you don't have to wait 100,000 years for this and 3 billion, 8 years to this. You can actually do it by using consciousness to create evolution of the species. Contemplate that one. Well, there's so much here we're going to get into... <laughs> Uh, we'll get into conception next Wednesday and start there and talk about it. And where is that in your body? What part of your body represents these stages? And we'll explore this. Uh, what is the purpose of this? To help us understand ourselves at the deepest level that's available to us to understand our incarnation into the human experience and how to change patterns that is not allowing us to have a fulfilled human experience. We deserve that. It's our inheritance. Religion used this man suffering on a tree, on a cross, to keep us in a state of being spiritual is to suffer. Most religion is built on suffering. People have beat themselves and whipped themselves because Jesus was whipped 39 times. Jesus hanging on a cross. How can I look at my Savior on a cross in misery and be happy when I'm a follower of Jesus? These pictures and things have been put into our minds to hold us to be less than who we can become as spiritually conscious evolved beings. Join with me in just a moment. Holy Spirit, sometimes I think I didn't understand the cost of turning this over to you and losing my control and always trying to do what I think is the way it should be done or said. But I did. And I did it long before I came here in a contract. Confirmed at my conception. This is who I am. 
And let those that have ears hear, those that have eyes to see, let them see. Let this word today go out and reach everyone that it is to reach who is ready to put the axe at the root of their tree, their family tree. A Native American saying is that if you want to feel the sun shine on your face, come out from among the family tree. Doesn't mean we can't love our families, be with our families and have that, that experience, but it cannot define us fully for these are those we've chosen to come through, not just from. There's an urgency in the air as well as a clarion call in the air for us to come forth to do the deeper work. And so it is. We all say amen. Thank you so much for joining. And I hope that this is something maybe you want to listen to again. <laughs> Check it out again. Check it out again. So thank you. Remember, Again, I always want to not take it for granted you that take the time to be with us in this class, both here and online, and your wonderful support to keep this class going and Heartlight Spiritual Center. Next week is our Power uh, Sunday. It is our last, our 12th Power. We've been through this year, every month. First uh, has been uh, our Power Month. This month is uh, Generative Life. So we're going to talk about life, what that really means, and how it generates itself in us and keeps us going and uh, able. So anyway, join us. It's also our birthday Sunday month. So please be with us and join. If you want to get here in person, come a little early. There are just so many seats to, uh, that is available. Or you can join next door. Maybe we can try to have some coffee, tea, or something for you that go to the overflow next door that come a little later, but you want to still come and be a part uh, of the service and maybe get out of the house and just go somewhere, uh, you're welcome to do that. So thank you so much for joining. Have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you again in the class next, next week. Also, we're really enjoying our little Tai Chi class at 10 o'clock, so I think all of you would feel much better about yourself if you'd come. It's in a chair. There's nobody that I know that could not do what we do in that class. And yet it is wonderful. It's just a subtle way of moving uh, parts of our body that we don't move every day. So come and be with us at 10 o'clock and join with us in that way. Bless you. Next time. Thank you.